Welcome to completing a Stuart Triple Expansion engine, this one's part 13. Dismantling the engine to correct some errors in the shape of the motion bracket and to clean up the support columns. It's now time to take the intermediate and low pressure cylinder block off the top of the columns. And the job starts by removing the pins that hold the connecting rods to the crossheads. Once I'd removed the coupling rods I thought it was a good idea to refit the pins to the crossheads so I don't lose them. This job is surprisingly fiddly to say the parts are so big. It seems that the support columns are just very much in the way when I'm doing the job. In this clip I've removed the nuts that hold the intermediate and low pressure cylinder block to the columns. Whenever I work on miniature steam engines I try and get into the mindset of the builder and if you look how the holes have been drilled in the guides for the crosshead, they are not quite in the centre. Building one of these engines is quite a feat of engineering and I think by this time the builder was getting a bit fed up with it. Time now to lift off the cylinder assembly from the uprights. But it's not moving, it's stuck fast. I'd forgotten to remove the 7BA bolt that holds the intermediate cylinder's crosshead guide to the motion bracket. Once I remove the bolt, you can see that the holes are not exactly in the right place. The other two holes in the motion bracket originally were not drilled. I drilled the first one on the right hand side and tapped that. I still need to drill and tap the one 7BA on the left hand side. I'm just having a look at what's holding this motion bracket in place and the answer is nothing, it's just a good fit. That is difficult engineering to get a piece of metal with four holes in it to align perfectly with four vertical shafts, which reinforces my theory that the builder was beginning to get fed up of this job. Maybe that's why he abandoned it, I really don't know. A quick word about the crankshaft. If you look at the crankshaft as I'm revolving it, you will notice that none of the crank pins are at 90 degrees to the shaft. I think they're set at 120 degrees to each other. That's why, unless the crankshaft is in exactly the right position, triple expansion engines are not generally self-starting. Often, twin-cylinder compound engines are fitted with something called a simpling valve, which supplies live steam to the high-pressure steam chest and the low-pressure steam chest. Could I fit a simpling valve to a triple expansion engine? I really don't know. I think I would have to supply live steam to all three steam chests at the same time. I might try it and see what happens. Now is the time to drill the other hole in the motion bracket. I've covered the crankshaft with a piece of oily rag. This should catch most of the chips. After drilling the hole tapping size for 7BA, I went ahead and tapped the hole. Making sure of two things. One is that the tap went in squarely and the other one is that I didn't break it off. That would not have been a good thing. Now with my newly purchased can of WD-40, I'm going to blast the engine with it. Not to stop it rusting, just to clean it. It made a mess on the bench and it went all over the surface plate, but that wasn't a problem because that needed a clean anyway. I spent quite a bit of time with a cotton cloth wiping off the surplus WD-40. And now as you can see, the engine is looking a bit cleaner. Time to separate the sole plate from the box bed. I didn't know that triple expansion engines came with a box bed and I still don't think they do but uh, this one has one and it's very convenient to mount it on. It's designed to be bolted to this box bed with three bolts at one side and just one at the other side. I would say that it would be a good idea to put bolts in from underneath into the two blocks which support the air pump and the water pump. And the sole plate will need some extra packing too. Time now to loosen everything. This is not ultra violence in any shape, way or form. It's a soft hide hammer just to dislodge the parts. The hide end of the hammer is very forgiving. I've had steaks in restaurants that were about as tough as this. Sometimes it's good to hit things without doing any damage whatsoever. The columns on the other side were removed in exactly the same way. And here they all are in a plastic box. The next part of the job is to reshape the motion bracket to match the crosshead guides. And to do that, I'm using my extremely useful Proxon bench clamp. Here, I'm using it to hold the drill in a vertical position, with a small drum sander fitted in the chuck. Using extreme caution, I reshaped the part so that the holes were only slightly offset, which, when the engine is reassembled, should look okay. 
Here I'm using a piece of Scotch Brite to clean up the part that I haven't been working on with the drum sander. I used wet or dry sandpaper first on the side I had been working on. And I got quite a smooth finish. When this is assembled, it should look okay. I cleaned up this side by using wet or dry sandpaper, once again followed by some Scotch Brite. This part does need some more work, it's a bit rough in places. Now it's time to put the columns and the motion bracket in a plastic tub, pour on some gun wash, which is used for cleaning spray guns, and this will degrease the parts because I'm going to put them in my tumbler polisher, which is not very effective if the parts are oily or greasy. The tumbler polisher is still on my kitchen table, which is quite a good place to keep it. This is the media that I'm going to use, Lyman Tough Nut Plus. I put a good quantity of this into the tumbler drum. I try not to put mixed metals into the polisher, because they collide all the time and a harder metal may do some damage to a softer metal. These other gun metal parts going into the polisher are the reversing shaft mounts. I really am warming to this Chinese tumbler polisher, and as it's on the kitchen table, I can watch it while I eat my dinner. For most of my applications, I run it in one direction only, and just set the 60 minute timer. After it had done its stuff and cleaned up the gunmetal parts, I removed them and added these steel parts to the drum. I polished these steel parts for about four hours. The only trouble with this polisher was that the drive belts were absolute rubbish and totally unfit for purpose. I'm currently using silicone rubber piston rings. The small one was my first attempt and it worked fine. These larger ones that I bought from Blackgates Engineering are absolutely perfect for the job and they should last a long time. In case they don't, I bought six of them. The one that's fitted to the machine has already done about eight hours as you see it here. These are steam grade, very good quality o-rings. If you already have one or you're thinking about buying one of these tumbler polishers, this is a great solution to the rubbish belts that come with it. They're also useful for making Olympic motifs. And on that note, I think I'll go. All that remains for me to say is stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.